Welcome to Creative Solutions for a New World, Climate and Artists series. I'm Frances Littman, your host. I'd like to gratefully acknowledge the Coast Salish people of this region and First Nations worldwide. For thousands of years, the abundance that these lands and water have provided us to live, work, and play is due to the reciprocal relationships by which Coast Salish and the world's first people have lived and live today. Some may call me a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I'd like us to take a few moments to imagine a world in harmony with nature, where peace prevails and people are thriving, not just surviving, where our air and water is clear and pollution free, where clean, green, affordable energy and zero emission transportation and chemical free, locally grown food is abundant for all and fulfilling life-changing work gainfully employs those wanting to create the transition that puts the eco back into the new economy, a new economy based on kindness and compassion for all with benefits to last for generations to come. Imagine this reality, it's possible. Our thoughts create our action, which creates our collective reality. And that's why remaining positive is so vital during these times. Now think of your favorite piece of uplifting music and what you want for this world. The feeling of joy and bliss that comes from listening to this music and your positive thoughts is something that is real. And we can come back to again and again, especially when the news gets hard. One song can change the world at the right time. Take for example, the influence the Beatles had on unifying the world and opening up Russia with their songs. And for those who haven't seen the documentary film, The Singing Revolution, well, you'll be convinced at the power of song when you do, as it led to the restoration of independence in the Baltic states of Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, from the Soviet Union at the end of the Cold War in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Pop star Billy Joel said, music in itself is healing. It is an explosive expression of humanity. It's something we are all touched by, no matter what culture we're from. Everyone loves music. Author Jack Kerouac felt the only truth is music. And famous Russian writer Leo Tolsky articulated, music is the shorthand of emotion, which was also echoed by Han Christian Andersen in these famous words, where words fail, music speaks. And like meditation, author and philosopher Aldous Huxley states, after silence, that which comes nearest to expressing the inexpressible is music. And composer Leonard Bernstein sums it up like this, music can name the unnameable and communicate the unknowable. Today, we will explore the power of music in a fabulous pro program co-presented by our community partner, Jonathan O'Reardon, who keeps the legacy of his late wife, Gail O'Reardon, a beloved music teacher and professional, professional cellist alive through this Climate and Artist webinar series, which continues each Wednesday from 11 a.m. to noon until the end of November. Welcome, Jonathan. Would you like to introduce some of our guests today? I would love to. Lovely introduction, Francis. In last week's uh, webinar on the art and science of universal consciousness, we learned that solutions are not found at the same level of consciousness that created the problems. Music is, can stimulate different forms of consciousness, as we heard last week, and we'll hear again today. So in this week's web webinar on the power of music, we are delighted to introduce two groups of musicians who specialize in presenting original songs and lyrics, which encourage us to take collection, collective action on climate and biodiversity. The first is Heather Reed and Johnny Miller, who have composed music to deal with the global crises. They've formed a duo known as Peaches and Quiet, and will shortly release an album entitled Just Beyond the Shine, which encourages all to lead a kinder and more sustainable world, which Francis outlined so vividly earlier in this talk. Heather will talk about this album later in the program. They've just moved to Pender Island, which is one of the Gulf Islands, lies between Victoria and Vancouver. And what an idyllic location to compose their and perform their wonderful songs. Heather and Johnny will kick off with one of their songs, and then Bob and I will engage them in a conversation about music and climate. This will be followed by another one of their songs, and then we'll move on to our next guest, James Gordon. 
So welcome, Heather and Johnny. Hi, nice to see everyone. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. Uh, we're going to kick off with a song called Walk the Tree Line, which is written by, was written by me during COVID, and um, you'll get a sense of it, and we'll tell you a little bit more about it after we've performed it, so... on a map, a lost page in the atlas of my heart, gather around me all the ghosts in the wings, voices singing in my ear the same old refrain. Thank you very much, Heather and Johnny. That was fabulous. Now, I'd like to introduce Bob Sanford, who, as you know, is uh, one of our resident colleagues and has been uh, is a water security expert with the United Nations University. But he's also a music buff, and he knows Johnny and Heather personally, as well as our next guest, James Gordon. First of all, I want to thank you for your magnificent song, and I also want to thank Frances for her extraordinary dream and introduction. Uh, Johnny, we, we know you as a, a renowned 
musician, but a musician with a, a deep social conscience. What came first, the social consciousness or the music, and how do they inform one another? I'm going to have to say that the music came first because I went to a Hendrix concert when I was still in the womb, so that was probably the first influence. But as far as being uh, in this world, uh, I would say the social stuff came first. You know, I remember being just a young tyke toddling around, and if I saw some kid getting pushed over in the sandbox or whatever, I'd run over to help out and that kind of thing. And music didn't really kick off until my teens, so I'd say the social consciousness. That's very interesting. Uh, interesting you go back so deeply into your roots for this. Heather, um, you also have a, a, a literary life uh, and a career in publishing. Uh, how does that a literary life overlap into your music and social consciousness? Well, thanks for the question, Bob. It's interesting that you're the one asking me this question because I met Bob at uh, one of Bob's um, <laughs> own literary events um, a few years ago. I met John the same way. Um, on the side, I do my music and then my sort of main literary life, I work for book publishers that are mostly independent book publishers around the world. And um, I have the lucky job of representing them in Western Canada. Um, and I find that the books and the art and the music all seep into one's consciousness um, and come out in the songwriting. They come out in just a sensibility about the world. Um, one song that we've written together in particular called Flowers Grow, which is on our upcoming album. This is a really good example of how they seep into one another. So Johnny and I both read this beautiful children's book separately and we're both greatly moved by it. And it's about grief and the acceptance of uh, the cycles of nature. And we both were so moved, we were actually both bawling about it <laughs> separately. And we went away from each other for a few days and we found out, um, we came back together after a few days and we both talked about how much this book had moved us. And Johnny said, well, I actually started writing a song about this. And I was like, oh my God, I started writing a song about it too. And neither of us knew the other were writing a song. And when we came back together and we started talking about it, we said, well, let's try playing this song. I'll play me your part and I'll play me my part. And we ended up mashing those two pieces together and making a song together out of it, which is really a direct relationship of books and music there. It's a bit unusual, um, but it was kind of magical too. There's three books that I came to mind when you had um, given me this question in advance that are currently books that I am lucky enough to be involved in in my literary life that I think very much involve a sort of alternate consciousness, a knowing of the world in different ways other than purely through the thinking. And John O'Rourdon was talking about this with the transcendental meditation and how it allows you to access a different part of your knowingness. And these three books to me all represent an excellent example of this. Braiding Sweetgrass, Bob, I know you're a big fan of this book too. Robin Wall Kimmerer, she's indigenous from the US and she, she integrates indigenous wisdom and scientific knowledge in this book. And um, it just gives the reader such a beautiful sensibility about the world that accesses a different way of knowing. Um, and Hidden Life of Trees, another great uh, way to approach the environmental world as um, Peter Voleben, the author, gives trees a sort of personhood in this book in the way that First Nations people do, where trees have a sort of, uh, they're described almost like conscious beings, like humans. And so there's beautiful storytelling here. You know, these kinds of books really open up your mind and your heart to different ways of knowing about the world. And I think- I understand that you have an album coming out also, is that correct? Yeah, we do, we do. Yeah, it's one of these lockdown albums. We started it in April, I think, and uh, working with Steve Dawson at Hen House Studios in Nashville. Really cool. So brand new process for artists that's opening up as a result of COVID. It's just fantastic because all of our performances got canceled, right? So we had to kind of go <laughs> creative. And um, this wonderful opportunity came up where this really high level studio in Nashville that we can't clearly go into and record opened up the opportunity to do distance 
track sharing where we can record at home and have those musicians add to the tracks and mix it in. So we've created- Well, I'm sure that uh, everyone's really keen to hear another song, perhaps from Yeah, them. yeah. Sure, yeah. Well, yeah. we're gonna play another tune that isn't on the album. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to say. But, this is uh, one of Johnny's. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a political piece, I guess you'd say. And uh, I mentioned Hendrix earlier, this is, uh, clearly influenced by Watchtower, which is a Dylan song, but my take on the, the general feel, it's called Interesting Times. The preachers have mansions Shotguns made of gold Bring them your donations You're hungry, tired, and cold Some folks have it all But some don't ever die Take a look around, people These are interesting times White House with crocodile teeth says he's gonna drain the swamp says he's fighting for rising the system's breaking down the green green grass of home the soul to Wonderful, wonderful. I wonder, I'm a musician, so I'd like to ask you a question about how you as musicians are making it these days, given the pandemic and the need for digital Zoom sessions and the limited opportunities for public concerts. Mm -hmm. so how are you getting on and what do you see uh, the ways you're going to be able to overcome this in the next uh, year or so? Well, it's super challenging. Most of us just aren't making any money in music anymore, just ground to a halt. Um, there are some government 
grants, provincial and federal available. So everyone's scrambling for those to try and see themselves through. Um, we both have day jobs. We'd love to be full-time musicians, but it's not really an option. Um, and other than that, it's all online, you know, friends that we used to invite over to jam. We uh, have Zoom meetings and you can't play together, but we take turns sharing our latest tunes that we're writing and that kind of stuff. And it certainly changed the collaboration aspect and being able to reach out to audiences and really connect. I mean, it's a wonderful thing to have Zoom and online, don't get me wrong, but it doesn't have the same kind of um, sticking effect, I guess. It doesn't have the same kind of community feel. So um, we look forward to when we get past this and <laughs> we can jam again and perform. Mm -hmm. Good for you, Bob. I just have one uh, quick question uh, that builds on that. Uh, can you tell me why you think this might be a positive transformational moment in terms of our society? And I know you're on pause with your music, but look at the music you're writing and what you're singing. As you said, interesting times indeed. So do you think this is a transformational moment? Yes, and <laughs> I mean, it, yes, it's absolutely a transformational moment. But in that transformation, I think we will, you know, go to a new place and we'll bring all the baggage with us as we all do in our personal lives when a relationship ends or you move or something. So I think it's a transformational, transformational moment. And I think there will be tons of work to do after it. What do you think? Yeah, it? yeah, I think so. Um, and what I'm also seeing is it's kind of like a, uh, a free pass for liberation in a way, you know, people who've been uh, craving change in their life or are looking to new ways to do things and maybe didn't know how to get it off the ground, new businesses started, new um, mm -hmm. new ways of living, uh, like us moving to Pender. This was uh, pushed up because of the pandemic. I'm seeing a lot of that, like a real people doing an authentic soul searching process. Because no, I think we've right there. That's come true. down, yeah, we've come down to what's real. Like what's real is our health and our communities, right, and our families, and staying safe, and that's important to us. And we've We're come back to that. Another opportunity to to sing another song that might address that further, as you've done masterfully. Uh, so perhaps uh, it, it's time now for me to introduce our, our next guest with our thanks to you. And we want you to come back and sing one final song later. We'll do, happily. Thank you, Thank you very so much. much. Please Lovely. stand by. Okay. So I first met uh, James Gordon when he came to Canmore and thrilled local audiences with his immediate grasp of local speakers and his astonishing songwriting. It's just absolutely astonishing. The program was called mining for songs and he taught local musicians how to think in terms of rhyme capsules and uh, he came for dinner and I discovered he also had an abiding interest in water and was also a city councillor and wrote songs about politics and social consciousness and the environment and I continue to be utterly amazed at how much this man does and continues to do. He has written literally hundreds of songs and produced 40 albums. Please allow me to introduce a, a great Canadian, James Gordon. Oh, thanks so much, Bob. Well, I'm thinking a song would be in order then. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is a song called We're Moving Up to Awesome. And it was actually named by, uh, I do a Tuesday tunes at two facebook live broadcast i wrote this song and they chose the name everyone watching i keep getting asked and i'm sure heather and and johnny get this too like what's going to happen when we get back to normal and this is written with the idea that we don't want to get back to normal we want to get past that we want to get to awesome <laughs> Back to normal, that's not what we need. Normal's driven by the religion and greed. Normal was racism, violence, and hate. Normal made poverty a permanent state. Normal was built on fear and dread. We're not going back to normal like oil. It is dead. We're moving up to awesome. 
That's where we need to be. Awesome's made from love and empathy. Awesome starts with harmony. Awesome starts with equality. Awesome doesn't leave anybody behind. We're moving up to awesome. Awesome is a life. wasn't fair. Normal only works if you're a billionaire. Normal was children locked up in a cage. Normal never paid a living wage. Normal and you never got ahead. We're not going back to normal like oil. It is dead. Empathy. Awesome starts with equality. Awesome sounds like harmony. Awesome doesn't leave anybody behind. We're moving up to awesome. Awesome is alive. Endless war. Normal was not what we're going bargain for. Normal was designed to fail. Normal was a Hollywood fairy tale. Normal couldn't keep everybody fed. We're not going back to normal. Let's get awesome instead. Awesome instead. Great, uh, James. Um, I'm, I'm very impressed with the term awesome because to me, it was a, one of the first words I learned when I started to fall in love with nature and water and forests. And it was a feeling of awe, a, a feeling, a sense of beauty that is literally embodied in the word awe. And I think it's what Francis was so eloquently saying at the beginning of the show, that we have a real an opportunity to move from the old normal which was not serving us at all, to a new normal, which is based on a kind of economy and a, a love with nature. So I was going to ask you, James, you've obviously been playing music for many, many years, and you also developed a strong social consciousness. What's come first, and how are you seeing transitioning your social consciousness given this new world that we're going to inherit? I think for me, uh, being a gentleman of a certain age, when I was growing up and listening to folk music in particular, there was a whole social conscience movement attached to that music. Uh, it was, you know, similar to the protest movement. You would have protest songs, songs that did raise consciousness. And that was my introduction to those themes. And after I became a musician, it's funny, I didn't make the correlation necessarily. Um, it, it took uh, traveling the country and touring to understand what a tool music can be in raising social conscience. And so I started to incorporate that more, but it also led me to take part. I'm sure Heather and Johnny were the same musicians. They're always the ones that are asked to show up at the rally on Saturday while everyone's carrying their placards and sing a song and leading the gang. And I, I was often, saying yes to those things about issues that I was just learning about. So sometimes learning about them that way got me to be more involved with those issues themselves from a social advocacy standpoint and now from a political standpoint. I wanted to ask you more on that political aspect, James, because uh, you're certainly a well-known political figure where you live and uh, you have taken your social consciousness and you've told it like it is and people respect you greatly for that. So how does your literary, I mean, how does your political life overlap into to your music? Because uh, you, your song just now demonstrated the extent to which that's so. Right, well, um, I, I think they're inextricably connected for me now. Uh, 
there's a lot of similarities. People think, well, James, you have two pretty bizarrely different gigs, being a city councillor and being a musician. And yet in both of them, I think we are mandated to communicate, to share stories, to um, try to listen to what people want and find ways to facilitate that. So they are, they are pretty related. I find I'm struggling these days with my job on council that sometimes I make a choice. Sometimes singing a song is more effective than making a speech because who wants to hear another speech? And yet, uh, as Johnny and Heather were speaking about, there are reduced avenues now for making one's music heard and moving things forward with that. So we're, I think you sort of go the path of least resistance. Where can I be the most effective? How can I best use my precious time? <laughs> well, using your precious time, perhaps you could give us another song. Sure, okay. When I started writing COVID songs, a lot of them were written out of a place of fear, uncertainty, despair, perhaps, anger, as uh, I saw different ways that people were responding to it. And I realized that there is a place for that. And yet what I need to do in my life's work, as well as through COVID, is to get us to a place of hope, because without that hope, we're not going to find that transformational moment that uh, Bob and John were speaking about. So this is a song kind of around that called We Are Broken, But We'll Mend. In this year of grief and sorrow, when winter wouldn't go away, we dream about a new tomorrow, when we can all go out and play. When the storm is finally weathered, when we know this war is won, we will dance and sing together like we did when we were young. We are broken, but we'll mend if we can just stay safe till then on the day that all this ends each other close again we are broken but we'll mend we all miss the human touch hand in hand and heart to heart there is only so much you feel from six feet apart we'll do an old-fashioned slow dance to at last by Etta James Will we remember how to romance Stir those embers into flames We are broken but we'll mend If we can just stay safe till then On the day that all this ends We'll hold each other close again We are broken but we'll mend at last my love has come along days are over and life is like a song amazing song uh, you are truly guiding us all toward hope and we need that <laughs> thank you so i wanted to ask you the same question i asked Sonny and heather uh, you are very hopeful and very optimistic, and but you're realistic also. But can you tell me why you think this may be a positive transformational moment? Yeah, I think I'm witnessing it now in both the worlds that I walk in, that um, for better or for worse, we are in a forced pause right now. Uh, I, I found so many people are being more reflective, and sometimes that reflection leads to more cynicism, okay, let's just get back to normal the way it was. Some are realizing 
in that pause, in that time, we're allowing each other to uh, the, the power of community we're recognizing, even though we can't touch our neighbors, we can talk to them and we're seeing the value in that. We're also seeing from a personal standpoint, uh, the value of, of creativity and arts in being a part of that transformation. I think more people are realizing it. And if, uh, if out of that pause comes a plan, uh, which I think it will, we can look past COVID and, you know, Bob, you're more aware of this than most that we were in a deep uh, environmental climate crisis before COVID hit. It hasn't gone away, <laughs> and but our thoughts of it have gone away, but maybe our thought processes are, are more directed now so that we can approach issues like that with more mindfulness, more compassion, and more caring, which is what I think some of us are learning during this time. So James, I wanted to touch base with you on my wife's legacy because she was a musician and also a climate activist. But what the thing that motivated her most about the climate and the arts was that she was quite concerned that when she went to environmental seminars and engagements, that only the environmentalists turned up. And when she went to music concerts, musical levels, levels turned up, but neither one was aware of the other's interests. Right. So she wanted to create music and the arts whereby you would combine climate stories directly with performing music. So the two, congregations in a sense would start to come together and not only share the same musical experience but start to have a conversation because they would start to realize that there are common interests between their two um, yeah. and interests and have you noticed that or is that something you plan to to develop as you can for, continue your career in this area? For sure I think that's a, a very good point and the way I've learned about it I do have lots of songs that are kind of ranty protesty songs um, I've learned that people don't want to be hammered over the head with a message. Uh, if I tell you, you're living your life wrong, you're going to say to me, screw you. <laughs> but if I can invite people into an issue through my music, and in fact, I would consider, you know, I'm a politician, I'm a musician, but I think I, I started as an entertainer, really. If I can suck people into something by giving them something there that they can tap their foot to, that they can listen to, then you're slipping the message in in a different way. And as you said, you're inviting people that might not be aware of it. You're not necessarily preaching to the converted, but you're uh, preaching to a choir. Nonetheless, people are appreciating the musical aspect. <laughs> can I ask uh, how we can help in this age of digital overload and pandemic yep. to get yep. the kinds of positive inspiration that uh, you are are offering, and Johnny and Heather are offering, out more yeah. wide. How do we uh, help get your messages out? Uh, it's a very important question right now. Um, and just like climate change, a lot of us forget in the arts that the, particularly the music business was in deep crisis before COVID hit too, because of our, our changing ways that we want to receive music and how to how to watch it. So the only way that we can move forward is a greater education and understanding from the general public that if you're downloading my song from Spotify, uh, I get 0. 0.0008 cents a, <laughs> a listen for that. That's not gonna sustain any musician, but I've changed my tune. I'm saying, go ahead. Uh, Download, but if you understand that that does not sustain an artist, we have to find new ways to be sustainable. Sometimes some folks are doing it through Patreon. Some folks are, are saying, well, okay, I, I don't even have a CD player, but I'm gonna buy that CD because I know that supports an artist. And it's as simple as saying, if we can't find a way to be sustainable, we can't make the music that you're trying to download for free. So it becomes a vicious cycle. Uh, perhaps, uh, Francis or John, we, we may want to listen, hear some of the comments or questions from uh, people listening in on the webinar. John, did you want to throw in a question or a comment there? Well, I was, I was really interested in um, Heather and Johnny's 
new album. And I was wondering what you think are the main messages that you're trying to get across in this new album that will um, inspire people to take uh, climate action as we go forward? Uh, I would say, you know, it all kind of boils down to love and love will find you in the end. So keep at it and don't be too disheartened. How do, how do you see it, Heather? Yeah, I think love and the willingness to look at the dark places, you know, um, I think that to move forward in compassion and love requires us to be okay with the myriad things going on internally inside of us, to be sort of fearless cartographers of the heart, you know, um, and without a willingness to sit with the painful places in yourself, you cannot move forward from a place of love and compassion. And so I believe that this album, which mostly is music written by Johnny, I've written a few of the pieces on there, um, and um, this, this actually bleeds through all of Johnny's music, this message, which I love. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that's the main message in the album. I just wanted to make one comment on James's uh, response there. Uh, I hadn't thought of this, but this is a transformational moment for music also. And I think this is a moment of great change for so much more than we think. Do you just want to comment on that, James? I think uh, the transformational moment for music is that we have to, it's going to have to hit bottom even more than it is for uh, all of us music patrons to understand what is not sustainable about it. So it's now or never, really. I can't see if we come out of a COVID situation that we're going to get to a situation that's any better unless we start over in how we sustain and appreciate our artists. Which makes me think of the song or the lyrics and the day the music died. Yeah. Kind of felt like when COVID hit, uh, I sort of thought, and people couldn't gather, that's what... Uh, I felt in my heart and the day the music died. But the good news, as you've been saying, it's a t very cathartic time for a lot of uh, creativity and writing. And it's just a matter of finding more creative and different ways to get things out there. You know, Johnny um, Miller, it's it's so great to, to hear you again because Creatively United had the great pleasure of hearing you perform in 2014 at a sold out show we hosted in the theater at St. Anne's Academy that featured many of the city's finest musicians performing these iconic songs that have made a difference. And this that was the first time that I heard you perform and I can understand why you're so well respected. Um, we have a question here from Sandy Goldie. She said, I've been to wonderful house concerts that have been supported, that have supported musicians. Post COVID, how helpful can those be? They're the bread and butter of most musicians now. And they're fantastic and fun and inclusive and community building and all that. So yeah, if we're allowed to and it's safe, host house concerts for sure. Unfortunately for us in the music business, yes, uh, House concerts for songwriters have been a, a great, great venue. It's all comes down to math. Um, if people are no longer willing to squish 50 people into a house because they wouldn't be distanced. Uh, and yet to bring me out to do a house concert on Pender Island from Ontario would mean that I'd probably need 50 people to make it justify the trip. So we have to reassess the the equations that are involved in there, but I'm I'm hopeful that we will. <laughs> Good, yeah, and uh, this is from Jim Bronson. He says, getting through to a transformed way of life, it seems, we need to be touched by wisdom in our minds and touched by love and mutuality in our hearts. Music is the way, one great one for sure. So thank you all for being inspirational in your lives. Keep at it. We need creativity as much as possible. <laughs> and Lil Land says, happy to see James is observing Orange Shirt Day. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> But wait a minute, I have, for Bob Sanford, I believe that I got this shirt while I was standing beside one Vi Sanford, a counselor from Canmore, Alberta. 
Yeah. Uh, which is Bob's wife. So look yeah. at the political. You asked me this morning if I was going to wear an orange shirt. And I yeah. just, <laughs> that's it. You know, one of the things that we have seen in our work with the UN is that uh, even through COVID, it's particularly important to support the arts. Absolutely critical. And music is a central element of this. Because if we don't, then we may forget who we are. Mm -hmm. And so what you're talking about at this transformational moment is really critical. Well, I have a final question for both groups. Uh, this music, um, climate and the arts was something we studied a couple of years ago, and we don't see this being particular to Victoria. I'm looking to see to whether this climate and arts can become spread across the whole country. So are you seeing any of your colleagues in the musical world picking up the theme of climate and the arts. And do you think it's something that will take off and become a mainstream part of uh, entertainment and, and creativity in the next few years? Hmm. Yeah, I, I would say the musicians, they're at home writing songs about this kind of stuff, absolutely. But you pretty much get blocked out of radio and large <laughs> events and that kind of stuff if you're too much of a rebel rouser so <laughs> it's a strange i don't know what do you yeah. think james no well i've actually and when covid hit i was interrupted in a pretty successful touring schedule i was doing with a one-man show called james gordon's emergency climate musical <laughs> <laughs> and i found that it it actually helped for two reasons. It was a way of spreading the word and connecting as Bob asked before, both, or John about those two worlds together. Um, but I think the success of it was showing other artists that well, maybe it is okay to talk about that stuff. No one's getting on the radio anymore anyway. <laughs> so, so let's focus on those things and do them in an accessible manner. I'll return to that statement I made that we don't want to, hit people over the head with a message, but if you're introducing a topic, uh, my biggest sign of success in any endeavor like that is if I leave a town having made a presentation and I know that I've started a conversation in that community that will continue. And that's, I can't ask for anything more than that in terms of success and making a contribution to the cause. And something that, um that has always been a theme for me personally in my music, and I see it in other musicians as well, including Johnny, is the sense of moving people, you know? Yeah. Moving them, shifting them in some way, whatever that is, that internal thing that happens when you listen to music, that we can't really explain what it is, but something happens. It isn't always through the lyrics, sometimes it is, or um, just that willingness of people to shift. It's, um, it just opens them up to new ideas, I think, so. Yeah, it's truly mm -hmm. powerful. Well, that's why we include music and art and culture and all these things in these webinars. We think it's so important. Is that John would uh, wholeheartedly agree with that? I know. Yeah, and and uh, from Maria Nielsen, she says, "All you need is love. Doing everything from the heart." Fifty years ago, the Beatles and Flower Children were already doing it. We have to get back to it and really run with it. More music like that is what we need. So mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. That's a perfect segue <laughs> for our final song, actually. Really? Just come for my love. <laughs> well, thank you. I'll sit. With the pain until the sun shines again for my love, for my love, for my love. Tremble in heart. Lying in the street, you know I do anything for my love, for my love, for my love. 
surface Just beyond the shine I send everything I have To the other side For my love For my love Nice. Lovely. Absolutely. I just uh, wanted to quickly say, because we thought we were going to have lots of time and now we're running short on it. So um, what came out from Jim Bronson is he's saying, we can do this messages. That's what we need to hear more about climate change and visioning a new beautiful future is always welcome. And uh, someone else said that they um wanted to know if you knew Anne Shao said do you know a Vancouver singer guitarist Brian Robertson who writes and sings of contemporary social and environmental issues he's a fellow concerned artist and um, do you know about Bandcamp it's been incredibly supportive to musicians um, and then keep your eyes out for their new album from the dance hall players out of the silence cool. um Oh, yes. And let's see. Oh, my gosh. Now all the questions are coming in. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Evelyn, Evelyn Pinkerton says, for my love, if that's a title, um, I, I, they'd love to buy it when the CD is out. Here's another one from Rebecca. We are learning about the enormous sums of money being spent by the merchants of climate denial and delay of the transition necessary for survival. Do we have any anthems that harness the big uh, carbon airs and build alliances to get everyone, including those corrupt deep pockets, going through the window of opportunity? Yes, of course, you guys have lots of songs. John, over to you. Would you like to tell us? Oh, wait a second. Before that, we are we going to hear one more song from um, James, or would you like? To I'm talk? hoping so. Thanks. Uh, and for the questioner about the we can do this songs on my climate change musical, which you can get on my Bandcamp page. I have a song called We Can Do This. So <laughs> we go. Uh, this is a song called When I Stayed Home, and it is about what we can use as a transformational moment, I think. And I really appreciate the opportunity today. When I stayed home, I sorted through my old cassettes, learned to play the clarinet, got to the end of the internet when I stayed home. When I stayed home, short of things to do stuff i'd not done hitherto i kept busy missing you when i stayed home when i stayed home i didn't feel alone when i stayed home i knew i wasn't on my own i knew i was doing my bit knew i was a part of it when i stayed home when i stayed home all in a row, I planted seeds and watched them grow, watched old 80s videos when I stayed home. When I stayed home, I found that our community had such a great resiliency, you couldn't take that away from me when I stayed home. stayed home I dreamed of possibilities for shifting our society to make this a better place to be when we don't have to stay home yay <laughs> bravo bravo to you all thank you Johnny James Heather Bob and Jonathan Jonathan tell us quickly about next week Please, thank you all. So, uh, next week's uh, webinar is on um, BC Drawdown and Countdown to Change. And it's about two questions. What can one person do and what can communities do better to deal with the climate crisis? So we have three groups who are working together at this local level in, the, in Greater Vancouver and Greater Victoria, who will provide us lots of videos about creative solutions that people are doing in their own backyards. 
in water and planting trees and engaging their faith groups and engaging politicians. So there'll be a lot of diversity of uh, action taken by individuals and communities that are beginning to move the bar towards the kinder and more creative world that Francis was talking about at the beginning. Countdown actually is a year long uh, program it's on with TEDx and it's designed to engage communities over the next 12 months before the next climate um, UN climate conference, which is in November 2021. So we're starting that process on the 7th and on the 14th of uh, October, we will actually present the full program on the countdown webinar and we'll be giving you information about that webinar on the 7th. So it's a session not to be missed by people who want to take action and we're hoping that you'll join us for that exciting session. Thank you. Thank you all. Oh, thank, thank you, Heather. Heather. Thank Don you. James, Bob Sanford, our wonderful audience. Take care. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye.